Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Business Growth Pod. I'm Alan Draper. I'm your host. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining me today. I've got a great one. This one's going to help you in all aspects of your life. You know, I talk a lot about success. I talk a lot about personal development and kind of getting your business to the next level, whatever that means for you. Um, today, I've got Steve Sims. Interesting guy. Interesting guy. You're going to love this. He's the founder and CEO of the luxury concierge service called Bluefish, um, which is an internationally famous company that kind of helps people find these like once in a lifetime opportunities. But he's much, much more than that. He's a speaker. He's an author. He's a business coach. He's an entrepreneur. Um, rubs shoulders with some uh, pretty successful people. And we're going to dive into his career a little bit and and some ideas that he might have for you. So welcome to the show, Steve. Glad to have you. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So, t- so tell me, Steve, how did you get into this business of helping people find these once-in-a-lifetime events or opportunities? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> that's that's the uh, strange answer to that question. Um, I was poor and I was pissed off that I was poor. Like like all entrepreneurs, you know, we 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 solve a problem that we have, and then we find other people that have that problem. As a bricklayer growing up in East London, I had no money, and everyone that I knew had no money. So I didn't go out to set up the world's leading concierge firm. I didn't grow up to be, as Forbes called me, the real life Wizard of Oz and uh, E! Entertainment, the the nice version of Ray Donovan. I didn't go out of my way to do any of that. What I wanted to do was I wanted to hang around with really successful, powerful, impactful people. And I wanted to ask them the question, how come you're successful and I'm not? In order to do that, I had to do something that benefited them so I could get their attention. Mm. I was the doorman of a nightclub, so I knew where all the best nightclubs were. I knew when there was a premiere going on. I knew when there was an after party going on. So by getting Jimmy into the after party, even though he could afford the bloody yacht himself, he wasn't invited. I got him in. I now had his attention to go, hey, Jimmy, did you enjoy the yacht party last night? Steve, I loved it. Great. And then over lunch, I could go, hey, what is it you do? You know, and, and how did you get into I would literally do what you're doing now, but back in the 90s pre-podcast. I was interviewing some of the richest, most powerful people in the planet. Sole purpose was to give me the information that I could then action so that I wouldn't be poor anymore. It was a selfish reason, but quite simply, never wanted to be a concierge. In fact, I don't even think I'm very good with people, but I am good with getting stuff done. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean. I've I've been talking quite a bit about mentorships and how people can, you know, spend some time surrounding themselves with, you know, people they want to be like, uh, people that are successful in one area or another. And one thing that I recently shared was that before you you go after somebody where you want some something from them, some amount of their time, you have to be very clear about what your value is that you're adding to that person. Not the other way around, right? A lot of times people are like, well, yeah, I want them to mentor me. So they're going to be able to teach me all these things. They're going to be able to help me with this, coach me through that. But, um, you know, to get to the level that it sounds like you were able to get to, you had to add value. And it's very clear what you were able to add. And so that's such an interesting take that, you know, you, that's how you got your start. But you saw through this kind of this mentality of, no, it's it's one way street. They're just there to help me. And you kind of flip that and you provided that value first. That's incredible. It isn't really. It's very primitive. And sadly, today we overcomplicate things. Um Let's let's play a game, all right? So, Alan, I'm having a I'm having a barbecue this Saturday night. You happen to be in Los Angeles, and I go, Alan, why don't you come to the barbecue? What's the first question you ask me? What do you want me to bring? Was it that hard? You see, just the primitive. If I'm inviting you to my party, what can you bring to the party? Now, 
I've worked mm. with some of the most powerful names and I could name drop to piss you off. The amount of times people come to them and they're like, hey, 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 uh, yes, uh, I'd like you to be on my podcast. Oh, I'd like you to endorse this. Oh, can I get a photograph of you with my product? Can I get you to write a forward in my book? You know, like I have people come up to me and they go like, hey, I want to get Elon Musk on my show. Sure shit you do, but why does he want to be? People are asking the question from the wrong angle. It's not a case of what you want. It's a case of why would they want what you want them to do? So whenever you go up to anyone, think to them, what can you bring to the party with me? Yes, it was dashing good looks, but also it was a case of I could get you into places that either you weren't invited to or you didn't know about. You know, I knew when there was an opening of, you know, an unveiling of a new Mercedes, a new model of Mercedes, and I would get them into it. You know, they Mm. could buy the dealership, but this was just me thinking outside the box and it'd be able to find up and go, Alan, I don't know if you're busy Thursday, but there's the, there's a movie premiere of the new Top Gun, Top Gun movie. Would you like to go to the secret premiere of it? You know, just, now I'm going to charge them, but the fact that I was doing things to give them a more interesting life and I was thinking of them gave me the ammunition to then go, hey, let's get together and have breakfast. I demonstrated what I could do to you or do for you Now I want to chat with you. And people think conversations are harmless, but the amount of information and education you can get from them is paramount. You know, something that I'm kind of right in the middle of right now, Steve, is I'm starting to get some pretty um, serious demands on my time with the different businesses that I own and the different um, pursuits that I'm kind of after. And, you know, I, I hear kind of mixed advice. I hear you know, make sure that you're giving everything that you've got away for free in a lot of cases. And then on the other hand, get really good at saying no. And so what's what's that balance for me to be kind of giving back, developing these relationships with people that are, you know, wanting some aspect of my time and being able to control my time and work on the things that are important to me by saying no. So when you give away all of your information for free, then you've really just built up a a community of people like that like things for free. (laughs) That's that's the first thing, okay? So you want to really quantify not so much your information, but your time. How much time do you have left? You can make more money, but you can't make more time. Now, I have a free Facebook group called An Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims. And I dump my views in there. I dump my videos in there. I do live AMAs. I do, and I urge everyone to do this. Have a platform that you can put all of that stuff in. But if they want to take it to the next step, hey, you got to pay. Like, And again, I'm not pitching it. In fact, I'm not going to give you the link. I charge $750 for a 30-minute phone call. Now, the funny thing is, my attorney says to me, how come you're charging more for a phone call then I charge it. And, but I charge 750 bucks for 30 minutes. Now, here's the thing. When someone's paying that amount of money, you can guarantee two things. One, they're in pain. Because if you're spending that amount of money to get the answers you need, you've got a problem you need, you need solving. Secondly, if you're spending that amount of money, you've more than likely got the amount of money required to activate the solution to the problem you've got. Mm. Now, how many times do we get people go, oh, uh, do you have five minutes? I want to pick your brain. Yeah. And then you look at them and you go, and I've done this. I've done this many times. I've gone, sure, how can I help you? Well, I've got this problem, this problem. You go, okay, what you need to do is you need to rework your funnels. You need to change your website and you need to do this. Yeah, I ain't got the money to do that. And then you're back where you started. So. <laughs> You know, the the bottom line for me is I provide platforms, podcasts, okay? These are my free conversations. And I interview, Mm. just like you, fantastic thought leaders, influencers, people with different perspectives. That should help you. It doesn't cost you anything. I have my free Facebook group. I have my Instagram profile as Steve D. Sims. I'm always posting stuff up there. There's my free stuff. Hmm. But when you want to take it personally in depth, then if you don't pay, you don't pay attention. Yeah, that's interesting. And I agree, there has to be some type of sacrifice on their end 
in order for it to mean something to them. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that you've spent a you know significant portion of your life trying to find out from the quote unquote successful what separates them from the unsuccessful or for the or from those that lack it. What have you discovered? Oh, I, you know, funny enough, and I did it for 25 years. Same similarities for the first thing. People, people that are really successful, they focus on impact. So they view time differently to non-successful people. Look at COVID, okay? COVID came across, and I don't know if you're aware of this, more millionaires achieved millionaire status during the worst two years of any of our lives in the biggest pandemic, the only pandemic, than at any other point in our life. Now, you think of all of the booms that we've had. Mm. We've had the dot-com boom. We've had the real estate boom. We've had um, you know, millennials, you know, uh, all these different periods where people mm. made a lot of money. But in the worst two years of our existence, more millionaires were created than at any other time in the world. Why? Because entrepreneurs react to difficulty, adversity, and to time differently than anybody else. When we got hit with COVID, how many people were, and I saw this and it made me cringe, they would jump on Facebook and go, hey, I've got the time now. What shall I binge watch on Netflix? <laughs> you know, how many people did you see doing that? How many millionaires and billionaires do you think were doing the same thing? I run a company, Sims Media. It had our best two years because people wanted to focus on what's going on. Let's pick mm. on what's going on now, the recession and depression. Mm -hmm. Everyone, now we were joking about the crypto before. Mm -hmm. Everyone's bitching and moaning, oh, we're coming into a recession, we're coming into a depression. I guarantee you wealthy people will get wealthier during this time frame. During the recession, you're going to need to double down on what the value it is you have. People will still have money, but they will become careful where they part with it. So you've got to, com you've got to increase your value but it won't put you out of business. You just have to play harder. And it's those people that won't play harder that will bitch and moan and put their hand out waiting for the next government, uh, government handout. So why are successful people more successful? Because they view time differently. What can I do today hmm. that's going to create the most impact? That's one thing. Secondly, people. You've, you've heard this thing about rich people. They go, oh, let, let's play golf. Oh, let's have lunch. Oh, let's meet for cocktails. And you think to yourself, that's just what rich people do. And then I realized it. And someone said this to me. You never, ever meet someone on an interview. You meet who they want you to think they are. Hmm. So they go out and have lunch with people to get to have time with that person to see if that person is the right cultural fit. I don't hmm. care if you know how to um, use Microsoft Word. I don't care if you know how to use freaking Outlook or write code. <laughs> Shit, I can send you on a course to do that. I want to know if we share the same culture, if we share the same beliefs. So successful people, mm. they recruit on culture, not on CVs or resumes. Those were the main things that I really noticed mm. was those two points. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you know, as, as, you know, the recession, I saw some, something today about how, um, the, you know, Google hits for recession or depression or downturn or whatever yeah. have started to kind of go through the roof, so to speak. Um, and I hear a lot of the negativity and, and to your last point, you know, you, you do want to rub shoulders with people that lift you up, right? That's the culture aspect. In, in whatever um, area that you need help with. And, you know, I might, from what I've personally discovered, I might add one thing to your list about the successful. And that is, I, I feel like the successful look at things differently. You mentioned several times that, you know, this idea of building extreme wealth in times of economic downturn. And, um, I remember when OJ Simpson was on trial and there was this, there was this, 
part of it where I guess the cops go to his house or something, try to arrest him, or I don't remember the details, but he takes off in his white Bronco. Okay. This is the nineties, Los yeah. Angeles. And, and I remember watching that on TV, you know, there's the aerial footage and there's the cops behind him and there's the people on the overpass, like with signs and all sorts <laughs> of stuff, right? Like national world news. Right. Yep. And after that day, Steve, I noticed a lot more white Broncos driving around. And I'm like, where the hell are these white Broncos coming from, man? Like, do, are, are people just going and buying them because of OJ? And I kind of, and I was probably 13, 14 at the time. And then I came to the re- realization that they were always there. It's you just, just didn't what, see them. I just wasn't focused on them. I didn't see them. Right. Yep. And so I think the one thing that I might add is that the successful, they see things differently. They do. Right? So, so they're going to see opportunities in this recession, whatever it ends up being, right? That's around the corner. And, and they're going to capitalize on that. First of all, they've been preparing for it. And, and they're going to be able to see where I hear you know, family members or certain people saying, oh, it's going to be, oh, the world's over. Biden's doing this or that or whatever, right? Whether you agree with what he's doing or not, there is going to be that opportunity. And the ones that capitalize on it are going to be the ones that are able to see it and that have trained themselves to see it and trained their mind to, to know that something good is going to come out of it. I want to add to that. I want to give you a strategic plan or something that you can action, your listeners can action. I had that exact conversation with a gentleman over in Hong Kong. And he said to me, he said, he literally said to me, how do you go home? Because I was living in Hong Kong at the time. And I said to him, well, I live in Lantau Island. So this is how I go home. He went, go a different way. Mm. And I went, what do you mean go a different way? He said, go a different way. Now, if anyone knows Hong Kong, Lantau Island, you get on a boat and you go to Lantau Island. You can't go a different way unless you travel to the other side of the island and get on a different boat. And he went, then do that. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, start getting your brain to look at things differently. And so on that day, I started going home a different way. And I live outside of Los Angeles now. Quite often, I will go home a different route, Mm. even though it'll take me out of my way. And here's something I always do. And actually, my kids, I've been doing it with them for like 12 years now. And when we first started doing it, they hated it. Now it's a game as to who gets to do it. And I'll explain. Whenever you go into a restaurant and you get the appetizers, you usually pick the two or three appetizers that you usually have that you know everyone on the table Mm. likes. Mm -hmm. Well, we would always pick one or two of those, but then pick the outcast as the third one. What on this appetizer menu don't I recognize? What have I never tried? And we'll pick that. Now, In the early stages, my kids would be like, oh, that's probably going to be horrible, blah, you know, kids. Um, And they would get it, and we'd be like, oh, we really like it. And now it becomes one of our favorites. Now, we do that when we go to Indian restaurants, Persian restaurants, sushi restaurants. Mm. I can tell you, I've eaten some of the most disgusting things known (laughs) to mankind, but it trains my mind to just go, hey, I'm going to look at something different. I'm going to look at this menu. And I'm challenging my mind to accept and recognize something different. And then what happens is when you go out and you're sitting at home and you're looking at a computer and you see the word recession, the white Ford Bronco pops up. Mm. You suddenly have trained your mind. Hey, we don't have to do things the same. We do things differently. So what is different? And when you're like that, that's when you start watching different. How many times have you spoken to someone And you've both seen the same movie, Mm -hmm. but certain parts of the movie have stood out to them differently to you, and you didn't even recognize it because they are open to opportunity. That's Mm. what did it for me in COVID. That's what's going to do for me in a recession. Am I worried or concerned about the recession or depression? Absolutely not. Do I want it to come? Absolutely not. Am I prepared to make it work for me? Hell yeah. And that's the big difference. That's the main thing there. Whether it comes, whether it doesn't come, I'm prepared to make that bitch work for me and not vice versa. Yeah, I think that's fantastic because there's this focus on what can we control, right? Where 
where people that really struggle, whether they're negative or, you know, whatever issues that they have, they always seem to be blaming those issues on other people. And I'm going to be honest with you, Steve, I have a really hard time blaming other people. And here's why. I don't want them to be in control of my life. When I blame people around me, whether it's the weather or the economy or, you know, a business partner or a bank, whatever it is, I have a really hard time because what I'm saying is my success is not dependent on me. It's dependent on these external forces. And and I just I, I try not to allow myself to do that because I'm not the type of person that wants my life to be in other people's hands. And so I think that's what, you know, allows me to find opportunity, even when I'm not super happy with certain things a president might be doing or whatever the case is with what's going on with the economy and kind of having that opportunity. That's one thing that's allowed me to find opportunity when there's a lot of naysayers or doomsdayers doomsdayers out there is that I want to, you know, hustle a little harder um, and, and see what, what I can find, because I think, I think when, when things start to turn a little bit, Steve, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's more opportunity for hustle. I think there's more opportunity for the quote unquote little guy. There's more opportunity. People are getting more creative, whether you're, you're buying some real estate or getting into business. There's more opportunity for creativity to come into play versus, you know, during great times when, you know, larger corporations are dominating or whatever. Do you agree with that, with this idea that, you know, when things start to turn, opportunities pop up just because things start to become a little unconventional? So someone said to me a while ago, great sailors thrive in rough seas. The problem is when everything's going well and the economy is just doing well, let's take the mortgage rate for a start. There's Mm. so many mortgage brokers out there now, and I do a lot of speaking gigs for the mortgage community. So these are my Mm. people, but I'm going to say it. (laughs) There's a lot of mortgage brokers that have got their head up their ass that think they are brilliant. (laughs) They are not. The situation was brilliant, Mm. and a three-legged dog could have ridden that exact same trail that they did. Now that it starts getting a bit tough, that's when the brilliant people are going to pop out. That's when the people that know how to work the system. You see, when everything's going well, we're Mm. buying freaking house bricks with Supreme written on it. Or we're buying freaking stupid NFTs. You know, we're doing all of those kind of things because, hey, the world's Mm. going well. We haven't got to worry about it. Let's not rock the boat. But when there's adversity, when there's caution, when there's apprehension, when there's concern, that's when the entrepreneur sticks their head up like a gopher out of a hole and goes, right, it's my time now. Now let's play. I remember I had a, um, when, the, when COVID first hit and here in Los Angeles, as I would come off the highway to where I live, there would be a guy there that was always selling some shit. You know, it was a little Mexican family. And it was like, when Kobe died, it was like Kobe memorabilia, you know, printed t-shirts, badges, flags, everything. When it's Valentine's, it's teddy bears. and flags. He's always yeah. down there, okay? Two days, and I'm not kidding, 48 hours after we got the news release in L.A. that we were closing down for COVID, the guy had a massive gray board out there with all of these face masks. Mm. He responded to the situation, didn't bitch about it, he moved with it. And my mm. dad always used to say, the, the, the wealthiest man on a rainy day is the guy, the guy selling the umbrellas. Mm. This guy pivoted. How many other people sit there going, oh, God, woe is my life? That stupidity. So, yeah, I'm a great believer that it's adversity that actually makes us stronger, smarter, and quite simply, mm. richer, financially better off than at any other time. Mm. I love it. Well, Steve, where can somebody find out more about what you do and and all the great things that you're accomplishing as we're wrapping up here. Oh, I'm dead easy to find. I'm a Steve D Sims everywhere. So Steve D for dashing, only one M in Sims, Steve D Sims.com, Instagram, Twitter, 
uh, TikTok, anywhere that you consume your media, that's me. Or you can come and join my Facebook group, An Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims. It's free of charge, but I am going to poke you. So be prepared. All right. Love it. Thanks so much. Uh, you, you can tell that your experience and knowledge is just vast. And uh, it's a real pleasure having you on today, Steve. Thanks for taking the time and doing what you do. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a rating. And for daily inspiration and business tips, follow Alan on Instagram. Until next time, remember, we build the future one entrepreneur at a time.